Okay, if uh, you have a Bible and you want to look at this, and, and I would encourage you to do that, and, you know, I, I have a statement that I have said for years, and that, and that is uh, seeing is knowing carries you beyond believing. Believing is a box that we get stuck in, and most mm -hmm. of us are stuck in our boxes. Yeah. In other words, our beliefs. You understand what I mean when I say that? Mm -hmm. When I say we're stuck in our boxes, our beliefs. Yeah. Well, that's what I mean when I say that is that uh, yeah. okay. belief is something you've been taught, something that somebody has uh, told you to believe. And so no, you believe that and you're stuck in that belief. So, uh, and I've, I've called it a box for many years, and in God there are no boxes. And now, <laughs> And I'm using a word here, belief, belief. And if you listen to your own mouth, you'll hear yourself, well, I believe, and then you'll begin to explain what you believe. And many of us have moved and progressed in different places where if you had what we call a salvation experience, but you had not experienced this thing we call speaking in other tongues, or you didn't believe in it, it was not within your box. But then if you had an experience where you experienced that, then you changed your belief and said, now I believe it. Have you ever had that happen? Yeah. Probably everybody. You all had that. That's what I mean. If you stay stuck in yeah. one block, box, that's a belief system. Then in that box or in that belief system, then you will, you will not be able to receive. And the key is to receive. You understand that? Yeah. That's, that's the key. The only way you can receive is to open yourself, to open your mind, and to trust. The Greek word trust is pistis. That same identical word is used for belief and faith. It's the same word. But the best word to use in the English language is trust. Because when you trust something, it may go contrary to what you believe, but when you really trust it, yeah. you'll go outside your belief. But if you're stuck in your belief, your belief becomes a strong box, then you won't trust. Trust is of the heart. Yeah. Belief is of the head. Yeah. And so God wants you to get to those things that are in your heart. Yes. The spirit. Yes. It's the spirit that's life. Okay? So when I'm talking about the heart, uh, you know, I, I just... Uh, passage of scripture passed through my mind in the Old Testament, I can't remember, it was Jeremiah or one of the minor prophets that said the heart is deceitful and wicked above everything. You ever heard that scripture? Yeah. Well that's not referring to the spirit it's referring to the carnal mind. Yeah. The problem we have is translations that have given us words that we trust in that word but not knowing they changed that word or added a word and we don't know that and the only way you know these things is yeah. either you do the research or you open your mind to spirit and let spirit confirm things to you intuitionally. And when the spirit confirms it to you intuitionally, you don't have to read the book to know it. Because you just intuitively know it. And you I know you've had that happen. I, and it happens to people like this morning. I, I would like to tear down some golden cash of beliefs. And I do that, I, you know, I do that a lot. I don't purposefully do it, do it, or I don't do it to I don't do it. To offend, I should say it that way. I purposefully do it because I know what I'm about to say. If I open my mouth, I'm about to say something that will challenge your beliefs, and I do that purposefully, but not to not offensively. I don't want to offend anybody, but people take offense because they're locked into what they believe, mm -hmm. and it's hard to get you out of that. So it's hard many times for us to move on yeah. with the healing that's mine. The prosperity that's mine, the blessings that's mine, because I'm stuck somewhere. Yeah. And so I, I, I you know, <laughs> I won't get you unstuck. I want, I want us all to, to be unstuck. I want to put the oldest symbol in the world on, on this board right here. And I want y'all to just tell me what that symbol is. The cross. What is that symbol? The cross. What? The cross. It's the cross. Absolutely. The cross. That's the oldest symbol in the world. That symbol found in every nation on the face of the earth. Doesn't matter which nation it is. That symbol has those two vertical and horizontal lines in it. And most people 
get many things out of this symbol. Matter of fact, all mythologies are drawn from this symbol, the symbol of the cross. Everything, all the Old Testament symbol, symbols and stories, even the stories, even the characters in the stories are drawn from this symbol. It's the most phenomenal symbol that we have. It talks about the above and the below and the horizon. So when we have the vertical, which is the saltus, saltus, everybody say saltus. Saltus. We hear the word, we know the word, but we don't even have a clue what it means. Soul is sun, stis, or tis, means steel. And so when you look at that line right there, that vertical up and down line, it's about the sun standing still. Well, if I say that in your mind, you are only thinking, if you're a Bible student, you're thinking of a passage in the Old Testament Scripture where that one of the prophets calls the sun to stand still. If, if you're thinking in that vein of thought. That's not what it's referring to, but it's referring to one of the most important dates that's important to each one of us. And that's called Christmas. So what does the soldiers have anything to do with Christmas? Has everything to do with Christmas? And many of the biblical stories are built on this symbol and the solstice. But many of the stories are built on the horizon or what we would call the equator. And the reason we call it the equator is because two times in a year it's equal or it's balanced. It's balanced in the spring and it's balanced in the fall. And everything about this symbol speaks volumes. And so what I'd like to do is I'd like to point out many things that are voluminous about this symbol. Because it'll change the way you think and it'll change the characters you think about in the stories. If you can hear it. <laughs> you can see it. And my prayer is that you will hear it and you will see it. But I want to uh, well it's just so many things I want to do with that cross. But I want you to, if you'll find Two passages of scripture in the Old Testament with me. If you'll find the book of Exodus in the Old Testament and the book of Leviticus, that's part of the first five books of the Bible. Leviticus chapter 23, just find that place, put your finger in it, and turn to Exodus. Exodus chapter 12, just find that place also. Exodus chapter 12. And look at verse 11 with me. I'm sorry, let, let, me, let me get you to go to one other passage before I even read. Let, let's go over to Leviticus. This one, Leviticus, this one is very important. We all are very familiar with this one. And let's just look at it and see what it says. Most people are familiar with what we call the seven feasts. Many of the, what they call kingdom preachers, preach about the seven feasts of the Jews. And the first one we have right here in Leviticus chapter 23 Look at verse, uh, let's just start with verse 6. It says, Six days shall work be done, but on the Sabbath, notice that word Sabbath, S-E-V-E-N-T-H, Sabbath, but on the Sabbath day is the Sabbath, S-A-B-B-A-T-H. This is the first time we see the word in English in the Hebrew Bible for Sabbath, S-A-B-B-A-T. In Genesis 1, or in Genesis 2, in, verse, in chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, it doesn't mention the Sabbath, S-A-B-B-A-T. Most people think it does. Most people think the Sabbath is the Sabbath, and it's not. None of the Sabbaths fall on the Sabbath. Now, isn't that a shock? So you always thought that the Sabbath, S-A-B-B-A-T, has to be on the Sabbath, S-E-B-N, and yet none of them ever fell on the Sabbath. 
See, you can just stop and think about that. <laughs> right here in, in Leviticus where it explained this. And the explanation of this is, is not hard once you see it. As you start to see it, then you begin to understand it. Because see, many of the stories, many of these stories in the Old Testament, especially the, the, the Torah, first five books of the Bible, that's the foundation and the basis of everything that we have, even if we call it Christian. So if you don't have your foundation right, Jesus tells us very clearly, if you ain't got your foundation right, the wind is going to come, the rain is going to come, the storms are going to come, and your house is going to fall. Why? Because your foundation is not right. Mm -hmm. Well, the Torah is the foundation. And the Torah is not given to us as a religion to promote a religion called the religion of the Jews. The Torah is given to us as a set of holy letters and glyphs that explain the awesomeness of this energy, this source that we have been taught to call God. It, and that's what it's about. It's about the foundation of your being. So for us to get to the root, the core, the foundation of our being, we would have to go back to study that or to find that or to learn about that. So right here, when, we, when we're into this passage, verse 3, Six days will work be done, but on the Sabbath day is the Sabbath of the rest, a holy convocation. You shall do no work. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all of your dwellings. These are the feasts of the Lord, even the holy convocations, which you shall proclaim in their seasons. Seasons, everybody see that. Everybody pay attention to that. In the 14th day of the month, of the first month, that evening is the Lord's Passover. Now everybody say Passover. 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 Where are we at right now at this time of the year? Do you know where we are? <coughs> Passover. Well, what does that mean? Really, what that means is on March the 21st, March the 21st, the, the, the astrological sign of Aries the sun passes over this equator. It moves over it, and the days equal out to 12 hours night and 12 hours daytime. So it becomes an equal balance. Yeah. The same thing is true. Now I want you to understand this. I'm praying that you'll get this and you'll understand it. We'll look at this a little bit more in New Testament mythology when we begin to see that. When it's talking about 12 hours Day, 12 hours of night. What it's talking about is a balance, an equilibrium of your brain. The male and the female. The Adam and the Eve. The 12 paired cranial nerves on the right side of the hemisphere and the 12 paired cranial nerves on the left side of the hemisphere which create the 24 elders around the throne of God. Where is the throne of God? It's right here in the yeah. crown. This is where God sits in the crown. Now when I'm talking of God, I'm not talking about an old gray-headed man somewhere out there. I'm talking about an essence of intelligence. And I tell you many times, for us to have the essence of intelligence sitting on the crown of our head, we act ignorant. <laughs> That's why Paul constantly said that in the New Testament. I wish you weren't ignorant, but you are ignorant. And I say that to myself because at any time to have this intelligence sitting on the crown of my head, I act ignorant. And I, and I perform ignorantly, which I don't need to. I don't have to. Why? <laughs> Out of my ignorance, I create my havoc. <laughs> so the only reason that havoc come, even comes to me is because of my ignorance. It's not anybody's fault. I can't point my finger you and say, Brother Lynn, you just don't know my situation. I don't need to. Every situation is different. And I agree with that. But every situation is given to you as a gift for you to do with as you please. Most likely, it's a learning curve. Most likely, it's a learning experience. And if you don't learn anything from it, guess what? Oh, amen. You get to do it again. Yes. And again. And again. And we repeat these things and never pay attention to where we are. Yes. And God's call is to pay attention Class is in session. Listen. <laughs> I mean, Amen. Oh, Brother Lev, I'm busy. I got to go pee. Well, whatever. Your body will call out all kinds of ways to distract you, especially if it's getting close to unveiling the root of your pain. Mm -hmm. yeah. Your body will pull you. Amen. 
Yes. Don't we? But again, and, and so God is very patient and long suffering with us. I know he's, I'm speaking out of my own experience, you know. So I know that. So the Passover, this is one of the most important symbols that we have in Scripture. We celebrate at this time of the year, and it follows what's called moon cycles. These feasts follow moon cycles, not sun cycles. Why? Because the sun cycles represents the spirit, the moon cycles represents the flesh, the physical, the carnal, in which dwells the emotions. And the emotions are there to give you an, an experience, a high experience to learn from, not to get stuck in. Ah. Oh, amen. True. Yes. God hear that. Yes. Children get stuck there because that emotion stirred something in them so strong they didn't know how to experience it, they got stuck in the emotion of it. So, this, this Passover is carried out in all, all nations, all cultures, under many different names. Uh, and of course, if we're looking at it in the Hebrew perspective of it, we've called this Aries, or the Ram, or the Lamb. Why is it the, the symbol of the Ram is the symbol of this glyph, and that's, that's how this symbol is. And the reason it is, is again, it's referring to the two hemispheres, the male and the female, the Adam and the Eve, the Ash and the Asher. Okay? Now, if we can get that, we begin to realize the story of Ash and Asher in Genesis 2 and 3 is the story of how God created the throne room to work, to function, to be in this dimension we call the earth, so that God can be in this dimension of the earth as itself experiencing itself. Didn't just create it to look at it. Didn't create it to be out yonder. It created it to be a part of it. So whatever God creates, God's a part of that. God's, yes. God's within yes. it. God's in it. So this Passover, this experience that we call Passover, is an experience that's taking place right now all across the land, and especially in Christendom. And what does Christendom call this right now? They have a, t a term for it. It comes from pagan mythology. It comes from the pagan mythology of Eshtar. Easter. Yeah, that's exactly right. We call it Easter. Paul addresses it in the book of Acts and calls it Eshtar, or Easter, from the pagan. And again, we say, you know what the word pagan means? Most people think the pagan means them, uh, them demonic, uh, satanic <laughs> folks. That's what they think. Actually, the ancient term for pagan meant common folk. You know who the common folk were? They were the farmers. They were the families. They were the people who kept society going. Yeah. That's what they called them. They were, they were just regular people. You pagans. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But we get all shook up. Why? Because Christianity made us think that, oh, at least it'd be pagan. Oh, you got up in the bed once in pagan. They love to get you in some kind of Shamu. <laughs> you know, and voodoo, you, you better watch it. You better watch. You see, we have everything so, pardon French, screwed up. Christianity and all of its manipulations and all of its twisting, changing words, adding words down for the last 1,700 years has got us in a pathetic place that we are waking up from and getting ourselves free from. Now, I don't say that to be condemning toward the Christian movement or Christianity because I are one. I'm not condemning myself. I want to free myself to be what God called me and designed me to be. Yes. And so part of what I would like to share about the Passover, the Christ, is about my own journey, is about what is the Christ. For instance, you will not find in Pauline epistles, nine, nine epistles that Paul wrote, not 13 or 14, the 13 or the 14 that's given credit to him are written by Catholic bishops. Five of them are written by Catholic bishops to deceive you, and they weren't. They didn't even show up in the church until around the year 180 to 240. Then those five epistles all of a sudden showed up, and guess what they said? Paul wrote. They never circulated during Paul's day. It's amazing that he wrote five extra books that didn't circulate in any of the churches anywhere in Asia Minor that they knew of. Isn't that amazing? But yet we have five of So we have nine epistles where Paul talks about the Christ constantly. 
One place that's probably more predominant than any other place in the New Testament, and the reason I'm talking about the Christ is this is about the Christ. The Passover is about the Christ. The, the Passover lamb is about the Christ. The awakening of the sun is about the Christ. And the Christ is an energy, it's an oil that's within your very being. Yes. It's not a person's name. It's never been anybody's name. The only reason that we have an idea that it's the name of a person is that the Catholic Church, the translators, yes. the yes. manipulators, the deceivers of what we have as translation, we call it the Bible that's not been messed with or touched with, and it has. <laughs> so, so highly manipulated. In Acts 15, we find the Christ more than any other place, and it's always about the awakening of the Christ, or the resurrection of the Christ, or the standing up of the Christ. In other words, the oil going from the sacrum, the, the gonad section, back up into the brain so that it lifts the whole body. Yeah. So that it takes the seed of the body, which is the logos, which is the word, which is that which God plants in us to grow us. Amen. Okay. <laughs> Uh, slow down. I, you know, that, this stuff is very passionate, especially right here at this time of the year for me, is because I just want us to see. I want us to wake up. I want, people, I want us to be free. Yeah. To be all that we yeah. have been yeah. real and designed to be. Yeah. Yes. We are designed to be godly, but we're not to die that way. We're to grow as God. Yes. We're to grow up into the head and be all that we are. We are the Christ. People can't even talk about Christ unless they're trying to put it on character 2,000 years ago and think that's the only one. There is no such thing as an only one begotten Son of God Amen. unless you Amen. look at the whole human race and say, the whole human race is the only yes. begotten Son of God. Yes. The word only begotten comes from the Greek word monogenous and the word monogenous means that you are begotten from one source only. In other words, Amen. that source that has begotten a uh, uh, Neanderthal person begot you. That's because that's the only source that can life you. Period. It's not about one man. That's what's disempowered us. That's why you're always call, calling for power outside yourself because you don't know you are the Christ. And that you are empowered yourself. I mean, you can't conjure God up. All you can do is stir God up. He's already in you. You can't go somewhere and try to contact and say, God, would you wake up from the ship and come and meet me at my knee? They just stir yourself up. Stir yourself up. Get stirred up on that which is already within you. And arise. Get that, get that anointing oil, that rising of that oil to come up out of your being. Hallelujah. That will transform your being. Notice this. this the, there's four points to this. Four cardinal points. The reason there are four cardinal points, I'm going to put some of them on the board uh, from the Hebrew glyphs. These are the Hebrew glyphs. yod Hey vav Hey. So what are the yod Hey vav Hey? Well, they're the Lord. We can use that word Lord. But what is the Lord? The Lord is the physical body that God created as His temple to live in. The Lord is not a man who lived 2,000 years ago. The Lord is you. You are the yod hey vav -Hey. Here's another thing I can say about this. This is fire, earth, air, and water. Now, I want to do this uh, differently because actually they fall in a succession. For instance, uh, Aries is fire sign. Taurus is an earth sign. Mm -hmm. Gemini is an air sign. And Cancer is a water sign. Now these repeat themselves. Fire, earth, air, and water. So Leo, Leo of course, the lion, it becomes a fire sign. Virgo is an earth sign. And you can look at these, you can look at these different signs and you, if you're thinking a little bit, yeah. Virgo, what is it? Earth sign. Yeah. Earth. You're earth vessels. You're birthed from the earth. Yeah. This is the womb. This uh, Virgo, Virgo over here. And see, because it's set up on moon cycles, it's always looking for the reflection. 
But if you're looking at the sun cycle, you're not going to see the reflection, so you're not going to know what the sign's talking about. You're looking in the wrong direction. See, if all you're doing is looking over here at Virgo, well, what is Virgo pointing to? What's her, what is she pointing to? She's pointing over here to Pisces. Pisces, which what is Pisces? It's the feet, it's the foundation, it's the, it's the place where the human rises up out of the earth. Mm. So you have, you have to pay attention to that. I'm going to try to point that out unless I get some carried away here. I don't get to it, we'll try to get to it later. Mm -hmm. So you start all over. Fire, earth, air, air, and water. And you start all over again. Fire, earth, air, and water. Now you see how they, and look how they fit. Where do the fishes swim? In the water. What is the water? The water always has to do with the human development. The story of Moses being drawn up out of the water. Moshe, his entire name has to do with the physical structure of the body. Moses represents the physical body. I can go through here and take you to any character you want to in the Old Testament Scripture and show you what part of the physical body that character represents because that character is representing a portion of the physical body which is the temple of God. It's not referring to historical character, characters that live. They never found not one. Not even one. They haven't found no ark on the mountain. They keep trying to tell you that they find an ark. I see these articles all the time. I've seen them for the last yeah. numbers of years. <laughs> I've been doing this for a few years now. I've seen so many of them for the last numbers of years. Somebody got a brand new fight. They found the ark again. They're never going to find the ark until they show a picture of a human being. Said, yes. We found the ark and there it is. Yeah. And you're it. Hallelujah. When they do that, they found the true ark. Because there is not one that's built out of acacia wood somewhere over in Asia Minor up on some mountain in the Himalayas. It just ain't going to be there. It ain't there, period. We're looking for in vain for things we can't find. That's why they never have found, never will find the foundation stone for the Temple of Solomon. Because the Temple of Solomon is the physical body. Again, if you want to find that foundation stone, look at the feet of humanity. Because you are that building. You are the Temple of Solomon. Now I wanted to point out something to you about for every one of us, and here's what we here's what we do. And I wanted to do this, and I'm going to pick on Annie because she has a easier sign to show. Annie's birthday, I'm going to put this in uh, green, is right here in the center of Gemini on June the 6th. Okay, it's right in the middle of this sign. See, the signs runs from the 21st to the 20th of each month, except for the month of February, which is a short month. But you can round it off 21st to the 20th of the next month. So generally, you have nine or ten days. Like if this shows up in May, you only have the first portion of this sign, which is divided into uh, three sections. The three sections are called decons or deacons, okay? And there's 10 degrees in each section. So wherever you fit, you know, you find all the characterizations of yourself by doing that. So here's Annie. She's born air. Well, look, look, look at her opposite side. What is it? Sagittarius. Now, all she ever looks at is the air side of her being. She won't see the true reflection of her being, which is the moon, the fire side. And then her, when she was, uh, her mother and father made love would have been right here in this earth sign. This is when her father planted the seed. He planted that seed somewhere around, let's see, this is uh, May, June, July, August, somewhere around August, September, probably around September the 5th, 6th, or 7th, her mother and father made love, and her father released that seed. That seed carried with it the divine imprint of God. That seed was God. That seed, actually, quantum science today has literally found out that that seed in that man carries the very light of the universe, the same identical light that comes from the sun. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. It's in that seed. Yes. That spark, that fire. Matter of fact, I read, I read of a doctor back in 1936 who had found this truth out and said, look, we found the, the truth of what really builds the body and it's the light, it's the energy of the sun. And they knew that. They've known it for years. So when her father released that seed right here, then she began to be built by the Holy Spirit for nine months, do, 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 all the way around to that point in time. See, this is when the seed was deposited. So most of what we look at are these two, the date that, that daddy, mom and daddy made love and began to build a house and the date the house was finished and mama said it's time for it to leave. Those are the ones we look at. We don't ever pay attention over here. So really the fire and the water are as vital and as much a part of her being and her makeup as there is anything. Yeah. Now the reason I'm saying these things is because Jesus said this in John. John says, you take up your cross. Well, what is your cross? Well, this is Annie's cross. Okay? And if I were, if I were going to put my cross up here, my cross would be just exactly like this. It would be here. And it would be here. Because I was born on February the 19th. And my father made love on May the 21st with my mom, gestated me for nine months, and then mama kicked me out of the way. Now you fit, and you, you see, if you don't know how to take up your cross, your cross is not your burden, your cross is not your, your weakness, yes. your cross is not your poverty, your cross is not your sickness, your cross is not your kids, your cross is not your mom and dad, your cross is not your family. Amen. It's not any of those things. Your cross is your cardinal sign. And when you begin to grab your cardinal sign and you begin to understand it and you begin to know your cardinal sign, you will begin to know you. And if you don't know you, you don't know anything. The whole work that we have is to know yourself. Man, know yourself. This is the whole point of man. So now, establishing the Passover, I want you to go with me to the Gospel of John real quickly. Wow. Just very quick, if you will, find John's Gospel. Let me see back in uh, John chapter 19 show you a couple of things here from this passage of scripture John chapter 19 and look at verse, verse 14 John 19 and verse 14 says and it was the preparation of the Passover now we just read about the Passover over in the book of Leviticus and the Passover actually comes from the Hebrew word Passah and uh I'll try to put that on the board here in a little bit and show you that word, um, kind of how it's spelled and the different meanings of that word. Uh, I would like for you to see it with me because it's very, very powerful when you see it from the Hebrew. But notice what it says. In these stories, I know you have heard these stories, but I want you to see these stories are hung on this astrological chart, on this wheel, on the wheel of astrology. Now that's not by coincidence because that's how all the ancient stories are hung. They're hung on this because this is the eternal this is the eternal pattern or plan of God. And if we see it or we begin to see it, it will help us to understand the stories better. So he says in John 19, verse 14, it was the preparation of the Passover and about the sixth hour. And he said unto the Jews, Behold your king. Okay? Behold your king. Then come down to verse 17. It says, And he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of the skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha. Now, in Hebrew, this is called Golgotha. Because in Hebrew, this represents the skull of a human being or of a baby in the womb of its mom. Hmm. Okay? So Aries represents again the skull. Comes from the Hebrew, the Hebrew word Galgotha. Which I would spell it, but that was a meeting we did last month or whatever. Which the word Galgotha comes from the Hebrew word Galgal. And the Hebrew word Galgal means the skull of the wheel. The skull of the wheel. What wheel? This is the wheel 
wheel, the astrological wheel. chart, yeah. the wheel. And it's in this wheel that the Christ moves. And it's in this wheel that the human body is stationed at our home. So that no matter who you are, where you are, you're hung on your cross in this wheel. And you're being hung on this cross in your wheel gives you your attributes, your abilities, who you are, the character of your makeup, everything about you is right there in that. And the more you know that, the more you begin to know who you are. So, he says, this is what was happening. Jesus' cross is the cardinal cross. But it's on the cardinal cross, all of humanity is hung. So what does Jesus, Jesus represent? He's not representing somebody in history who lived 2,000 years ago, even though there could have been somebody in history who lived it. That's not what it's about. It's about you because He yes. is a picture of who you yes. are. That's why He said, as I am, so are you. Yes. That's why He said, it's not me doing it. It's the source, the Father, in me and through me doing it. That's why He said, what I'm doing, you can do also. And even more. But you know what we did because religion? We said, no, He's the only begotten Son. No, He's the only empowered Christ. No, He's the only one heals. He, da, 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 da. It's Him. And so we have been stuck here for nearly 2,000 years saying that this guy could do it and I can't. It's time for us to reclaim our power. It's time for us to reclaim our identity. Yes, yes. yes. And until we do that, until we can shake ourselves loose from that, I mean, I hear it everywhere I preach and everywhere I go where people are always talking about Christ, Christ Jesus, this and that. And, and I'm sitting there thinking, no, it's you, it's you, it's you, it's not him, it's you, it's you. I keep the inside, I'm going to grab them, shake them, die. Wake up! He said it's not me, it's the power of the wheel. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you know, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm sympathetic with you. You want to honor a guy who was willing to hang himself on a tree on a post and suffer and bear it all for you. No, that suffering with that post is you. It's God put you on that post to suffer as well. Yes. That's exactly why he said, if you're going to reign with me, you have to suffer with me. Oh, me too? i got to be hung on the tree too? Yeah! <laughs> now, when we get all of this stuff ironed back and we begin to see as we are designed to see, we will begin to, the only evil, the only demons, the only devils that I fight or that I am up against are the elements of the world. And those elements of this world are the things that bring evil to my body. They're trying to destroy my body. It's not some entity out yonder. Amen. When you, Amen. we begin to study and we find out what are the elements. Well, when that child is pushed out of that womb right there, if that child does not have the care, the protection, the nourishment, the love, and everything that its mother and father can give it and, and keep it from all of the evil out there, if they just leave it alone, it'll freeze to death. It'll starve to death. It'll catch all kinds of diseases. Why? Those are the evils that it must fight all the days of its life. Because all of those things are here as a tension and a contention to yes. destroy your physical body. Mm -hmm. So when we begin to see what am I really fighting? I'm fighting my own ignorance, not knowing how to care for my own temple. Mm -hmm. Not knowing how to really take care of the house of God that God gave me. That God's already told me it's precious. Yes. Yes. This, is, this is what you are. This is who you are. So, so come down with me to verse mercy, mercy, mercy. Verse 28. Look at this real quick. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were accomplished, that the Scriptures might be fulfilled, He said, that the Scriptures might be fulfilled. He said, look at this. I, I, I want to get a couple of things in here. This is just, when you see this, this is so rich. It'll, I hope it will help clear up some things that's in our thinking. Uh, that scriptures might be fulfilled. Verse 29. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge of vinegar, put upon a hyssop, and put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar and said, It is finished, he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation. Now the Catholic Church and the religious church told us that that was Friday. 
that the, that the body is what the, that's why you have to eat fish on Friday. <laughs> All right, that's mm -hmm. Friday. The body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath day. So why? Tomorrow's the Sabbath. This is Friday. Tomorrow's the Sabbath. That's uh, Saturday, right? Yeah. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So and I only ask you, how are you going to get three days out of there? <laughs> how are you going to get three days out? No, no, it's what it says. I'll do it again because you can't squeeze three days into that. You can do all kind of gyrations with it. You can say, well, uh, let's say you didn't resurrect until Sunday morning. So we have Friday, that counts a day. Saturday, that counts a day. Sunday morning, that counts a day. So we got three days. Bull. <laughs> Bullshit. <laughs> That's ridiculous. That ain't no three days in that. Because we got other stories now. We got the story of Jonah. What about Jonah? What about the story of Jonah? Three days, three nights where? In the belly of the earth or in the belly of the fish. Yeah. That's not the only story we got. We have these three day stories. We just don't understand them. They're right here in plain vision and we don't see them. And I'm going to show them to you. I'll, I'll, I'll make it very clear. Notice what he says right here. In this, in this, this is an important verse. If we can, And this, this verse is written in Gnosticism. So what does that mean? This the Gospel of John is not a history. It's not a literal history of anything or anybody. The Gospel of John is a Gnostic Gospel. That simply means it's things that you will only know intuitively. Intuition is what reveals this to you. You do not get the understanding of this book by cutting a piece of man's flesh off and drinking the blood that's dripping from his body and you think, well, now it's literal. i got to take it literal and i got to eat a piece of his flesh and drink his blood. Bull again. Yeah. No, there ain't, that's cannibalism. We get so screwed up in these stories, we think, well, God is a cannibal. God's not a cannibal. We get so screwed up in these stories, we think, well, I mean, Adam and Eve had three boys. The boys got to have a girl. Where'd the girl come from? Well, evidently, they had, I mean, the boys have got to have a woman or wife. Where did they went down there to get a wife? Where did them girls come from down there? Well, Adam and Eve had them earlier and they run off went down there so them boys got to go down there and marry their sister. That's called incest. So God kick-started the whole human race from incest? Come on, folks. How can we be so ignorant and so gullible rather than to say, no, something's wrong the story. We are not understanding the story. And I'll tell you the truth of the matter. You won't understand the stories until you get out of your box and keep yes. quit making it little, quit trying to make it historical. Yes. It's yes. not. It is a phenomenal story, and many times that, that story requires other information to enlighten the story so that you can see clearer what the story is saying and what it's about. So look what it says right here, and you'll, you'll get some insight into this story. Uh, he bowed his head, verse 31, the Jews therefore because it was the preparation by the way, that's not Friday night. That happens to be uh, Wednesday morning. That the body should not remain on the cross until the Sabbath, which would have been 6 o'clock that evening. In other words, 6 o'clock Wednesday evening. So 6 o'clock. From Wednesday evening 6 o'clock to Thursday evening 6 o'clock, that's a day. Thursday evening 6 o'clock to Friday evening 6 o'clock, that's a day. From Friday evening 6 o'clock to Saturday evening, that's a day. And he rose early in the night on Sunday morning. There's three full days. Mm -hmm. Scripture validates that because it says real closely right here. You have to watch it in verse 31. Because it was the preparation that our bodies should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath, no parentheses here in the King James, for that Sabbath day was a high day. What was a high day? A high day was that which the book of Leviticus was talking to you about. The high day was Passover. Passover was not on the seventh day. Passover was a Sabbath day. It was a special holy day. So they had designated special holy days, ho holy days that fell through the week, not on the Sabbath. No, through the week. So on this particular day, this could have been any day through the week. Wouldn't matter. And we, once we start seeing that, you see one of the stories really are profound in their telling as we as we begin to really see them. Now go with me real quickly to Matthew. And I'm pushing real quick on time. I want to try to get a couple more passages of Scripture that I want you to see these. And if you have questions or if you want to make notes and we'll come back or if you... I 
if I lost you, you just holler out at me or something like that. Matthew, look at Matthew chapter 12. Verse 38, Matthew 12, 38. Then certain of the scribes and the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from you. But he answered and he said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and there will be no sign given to you but. Go give a sign. But the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was, what does it say? Three days and three nights. So that's three full days. Now, again, Jonah was three days and three nights in the, in the belly of the fish. King James says, whale's belly. So shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now, go with me um, to the next chapter. And I want you to see something Jesus said, just real quickly. In chapter 13, look at verse 34. All of these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables. Parabole. What that word simply means is he uses mythological stories, not historical stories. So if he's talking about Jonah, what is Jesus calling the story of Jonah? He's calling it a mythological story. He's calling it a parable. So when Jesus starts talking about Moses, notice it says, all of these things, things spake Jesus unto the multitude, and without a parable spake he unto them, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will, open, I will open my mouth in parables, and I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundations of the world. The only reason they were kept secret is they just weren't unveiled. Now they're being unveiled. Yeah. He said, I spoke these things this way because that's what they are in parables. Now, Find in the Old Testament, find the book of Hosea. It's one of the minor prophets. And this is where this story begins to make sense. And I'll show it to you. Hosea. Just fine. He's, a minor, he's one of the minor prophets. He's from Ezekiel, Daniel, to the back of Matthew. You'll find him sandwiched right in there in little bitty play, pages where the leaves are stuck. <laughs> You least get stuck because we don't uh, we don't read those. Totally understand. Whew, okay. Uh, gosh. While you're finding Hosea, I want to read you something here that's written by uh, Alan Boy Coon. And it's about the uh, psychologist that we know of as Carl Jung, who was, Carl Jung was a very, very phenomenal, phenomenal psychologist that lived uh, probably a little over 100 years ago. And actually he, he bought and he owned the most extensive Kabbalistic library in the world. So he was a Kabbalist. He understood the true meaning of the ancient Hebrew. He understood the true Kabbalah. Not the, not the false one that screwed up one that we have today. The true. The true. Which my interest is in the truth. It's not in all the other the things that's going on in the philosophies and things that people say. So let me just read you something that he wrote and then I want to uh, read you some things I wrote and then close with this passage of scripture here in Hosea. Uh, he says, uh, uh, debate may rage until doomsday, but there is only one answer to this challenge, the only one that will measure up to the demands of truth, a background of spiritual tradition which clearly dramatizes the apotheosization. Apotheosization actually means to apathize would be to deposit God in flesh. So it's this big word, it means God in flesh. That's really basically what that word means. God in the physical body. And we know that's true. I mean, I would think that we would know that. We do know that. Uh, of all humanity. The apotheosization of all of humanity. In other words, all of humanity to realize they are God manifest. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
That's what he's basically saying. Uh, of all of humanity. Was by ignorant men converted into the quasi-history of the life of a hero of ancient ritual who himself was but a type figure of our inchoate divinity in its full flower. So what is he saying? He's saying that the story of Jesus and or the life of Jesus was a typology of you and me as we not only as a bud come up out of the ground. Paul says it this way in Galatians chapter 4. Even though you are heir to the throne, the throne's not given to you because you're still a child. And Paul also says, being a child, you grow up into the full stature of the head. But we just get stuck. We just say, I understand. Yeah. You know, it's a shame to go to our demise at the end of days and still be a child. Still be sucking the tit of mom. Not grown and not becoming who we are designed to come. So here's some things I wrote. This type figure, type figure, same thing as Jesus said when he used parabole. That's exactly what parabole means. Types and figures. This type figures are in other words, and I'm just going to name a few. If you want more, there are so many books out there available to give you at least 36 to 42 of the God-man characters that, have, that are well known of in different nations all over the world. But I'll mention a few of the more popular ones of these type figures. One of them is Horus. He's one of the Egyptians. Uh, another one is Bacchus. He's a Babylonian. Another one is Krishna. He's an Indian. Another one is Hercules. Hercules was also in the uh, Greek, Greco-Roman character. Y'all heard, heard the story of Hercules and his twelve labors? The story of Hercules and his twelve labors is a similar story to Jesus and his twelve apostles. Same thing is true with Bacchus, with Horus, and the list just goes on and on and on. What are these type figures about? Why do we have these type figures? These type figures were given to us to show us humanity, our own innate divinity and potential godhood. The divinity slash godhood is to be cultivated and developed by each and every individual as a part of our growth from infancy to maturity. As Paul alludes to in Galatians chapter 4, and uh, I put a note here on page 19, uh, the center of page 1, yet, uh, yet he, I can't even read my own writing, it's got cold. <laughs> I write all in these books and so I go back here and read you what I wrote it's, it awakens the divine deposit slash spirit of God in, in every of every human being both through revelation and knowledge now let me say this to you revelation without knowledge leads to emotions and stuck with no growth. They no good just go, oh God, I saw them. Yeah. Do you have knowledge of what you saw? Because it's knowledge that empowers you and it's the lack of knowledge that puts you in bondage. Where's the church at today? It lacks the knowledge of the things that I'm speaking about. Why? It's ignorant of these things. They, they condemn me and they say, oh, oh, he don't believe in Jesus or oh, he don't do this or that. Oh, he's a cult. And now they call me a heretic and since I was put on the news up there for building a bomb, a threat to the, <laughs> not to the community, they, they brought the Channel 3 News out of Chattanooga down there, so now they call me a heretic. So I'm a terrorist and a heretic. That's a joke. That's just a joke. It was, it was a, a real crazy joke that was put on the police department of Varnell City in there in North Georgia. But anyway, revelation without knowledge is nothing. I mean, I used to get all excited because I would see something. That I didn't let what I saw. I didn't chew. I didn't muse. I didn't own what I saw. I just saw it and got excited. Oh, boy. 
Do you have knowledge of it? Have you chewed yeah. on it? Have you eaten the meat of it? Has it nourished you? Have you lived on it? <laughs> no. Right. Did they come alive? Revelation without knowledge. Mm -hmm. You have to have knowledge of the divine deposit of spirit. Of everyone, of, this is for everyone on the earth. Uh, plus the divine awakening. This revelation and this knowledge empowers the individual to be what the revelation and the knowledge shows him or her they can be. Wow. So we have to have that. It's not something that we can look over lightly. So let me read you this right here. Did you find Hosea chapter 6? And I want to show you what he's talking about. Come and let us return unto the Lord. Come and let us return unto the Lord. Now you remember I started out with this blip. Yo, hey, Love, hey, and I said, this is the Lord. Do you remember I said that? This is the Lord right here. So what is the Lord? The Lord is the wheel. That's, that's, uh, that's the uh, Galgal, the skull of the wheel. Starts right here. When your dad deposited the seed to create you, the first thing that it began to build was your brain. The last thing it began to build were your gonads. Your brain's the first thing, and your spinal column, your entire nervous system. In other words, God, hear this. In other words, the first thing the Spirit begins to build is the tree of knowledge. The tree of knowledge, because without knowledge, without gnosis, you're nothing. But it's knowledge, it's gnosis. That's, that's what begins to. Then you have to have the knowledge of raw and told, or in other words, <coughs> And evil. That's what it. That's what it's translated at. So it begins to build the Lord right here, the physical body, the entire wheel. So watch what he says right here. Come and let us return unto the Lord, for He hath torn and He will heal. He hath smitten and He will He will bind us up. After two days will He revive us, and in the third day He will raise us up, and we shall live in His sight. Now. People have looked at that passage of Scripture for hundreds and hundreds of years, and I'm going to, I'm going to mark these days off for you uh, right here. And I'm going to show them to you right here in closing. That's one day. Right here's two days. And right here's three days. Capricorn is the first day. Aquarius is the second day. Pisces is the third day. And after the third day, he will raise, the word raise is the same as resurrection. If you notice, Jesus was hung on the cross on December the 25th. Now watch this. I'm going to show you three days here because you have to do the reflection of these things. December the 25th, uh, 21st, and then the sun laid in the earth for three full days, and then on the morning of the fifth day, the sun rose again. Now, in the earth, in natural historical fact, if you live on the upper uh, hemisphere of the earth, the northern hemisphere, on December the 21st, the sun no longer rises. Doesn't even come up. <laughs> That's not totally dark. But the sun don't come up. And so here you are, on the 21st, and ain't no sun in the sky. You get a little nervous. Oh my God. What are we going to do? <laughs> sun ain't there. This happens every year. Every year. You go up there on the 21st, sun ain't there. You can't see it. Why? It seems to be buried in the earth. Well, in the Old Testament Scripture, that's called Shoal. That got translated for the word hell. So actually, the sun is buried in hell. As you in. Now, how many of you remember the story of Jesus going to hell? Well, Jesus is the story of all humanity. Jesus is the cardinal man on the cardinal cross. It's the story of you. So this is a story of you too. When we make these stories real, we make these stories alive in our very being, they will energize us. That's where we need the energy. We need the energy in us. Yes. I don't need to recognize the energy in Him because He rose from the grave. I need to recognize the energy in me because I need to rise from my yes. grave of flesh. Yes. The physical body is the tomb. Yes. It is that place where God deposited itself, buried itself in you yes. and me.
So on the 21st, the sun can't be seen. This is Northern Hemisphere mythology. And all, all of the uh, mythologies around the world pick up on this mythology of this story. Then on the 22nd, you get up, no sun in the sky. On the 23rd, you get up, no sun in the sky. On the 24th, you get no sun in the sky. Three days, no sun in the sky. And for somehow during the night, in the third day, you get up and the sun peeps up its head. And you know what? There is no time at all calculated from the 21st to the 25th as far as the time that the sun is in the sky. I wrote this down in closing. <laughs> I'm closing really. Yeah. <laughs> the longest day of the year of the solstice is actually right here on June the 21st. And it's actually, that longest day is in Waycross, Georgia. And it's 15 hours and 54 minutes long. Hmm. The shortest day is actually December the 21st. It's also in Waycross, Georgia. And it's only 11 hours and 19 days long. Now here is, here, here's the, listen to this. You get this, you begin to get revelation that will lead you to knowledge. From December the 21st until December the 24th, there, there are only 11 hours, 11 hours and 19 hours because there's no sun, there's no movement. Every day the sun changes time by somewhere between 35 and 45 seconds every day. It either is getting longer or shorter. But on December the 25th, 21st to December the 25th, days don't change. And so since the days don't change, you know what their assumption in the mythology is? Sun's dead. Because if the sun is not moving, if it's buried in the earth, how long is it that, uh, that they want to leave a body before they determine its death? Three days. That's what they, you know, it's not determined after the second day, it's after the third day. So this is the first day, this is the second day, and this is the third day. Why? Because these days are considered the cold of winter. From December the 21st until March the 21st, those are the cold winter months. Those are called the months of death. So for three days, three cold winter months, and then boom. And it's happening right now everywhere. Look at nature. Nature's mm -hmm. given up to life. Again, and we need to learn from that mythology, and we need to be that ourselves. Okay? Mm. Uh, mm. Now, this is just to be continued. i got a lot more here that you got to want to see. We're going to do well, it after lunch. After lunch.